the bogus theory behind Australia's economic disaster and the Labor Party scandal the Liberals are ignoring. That's what's coming up on this week's Citizens Report. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 15th of October 2021. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robbie Barwick. Welcome. Thanks, Elisa. And as we said on today's show, the bogus theory behind Australia's economic disaster, where we will look at how slavish adherence to market forces has led us to the point where average Australians cannot survive. And secondly, the Labor Party scandal the Liberals are ignoring, where we show that there's more to this branch stacking scandal that's being revealed than meets the eye. So firstly today, the bogus theory behind Australia's economic disaster. So we're going to delve a little bit today into the kind of neoliberal economic policies that we talk about a lot on the show that have completely dismantled Australia's productive economy over the last three or four decades, or more really, um, and that how they have eroded not only the real economy, but with it, the trust of the population in government and in institutions of government and other crucial institutions through which citizens can, um, you know, get forward in life, get along in life, have a good life, and also through which they can intervene into the political situation. Um, so we're talking about government bodies like regulatory agencies that people can go to to protect themselves. We're talking about things like a national credit bank um, that gives people access to credit to build a life for themselves, um, but also which keeps private banks in line and prevents um, those private interests from impinging on um, their livelihood. Well, the one, one way to understand this, Elisa, is just sort of go watch Lord of the Flies or read the book. Picture, picture society without government. What, what, what um, reigns is either chaos or law of the jungle type of arrangement, right? Yep. And for, for these neoliberals, that's their economic fantasy, that kind of arrangement. Mm. Um, whereas society has evolved over time because um, people recognise, well, there has to be a, an agency through which the public will can be expressed, right? The common good can be ensured. And um, governments developed around that concept. And the great Abraham Lincoln said in his Gettysburg Address that, that um, uh, he put it the most beautifully, government of, for and by the people. Now, people will recognise that government uh, in general hardly um, you know, marks up to that standard, right? It's, it's, you very seldom see it. However, historically you can see plenty of examples of it, actually. And, and it's in those examples of good government where society has progressed uh, quite rapidly. But the neoliberal era, it's been demonised and, yeah. and then people have lost faith for good reason. But if you lose faith and, and don't participate, in, stop participating in the process because you think you can't change anything, mm -hmm. you never will change anything and it's just going to get worse. Mm. And that's what we've got to turn around. Yeah, so um, by restoring people's faith in institutions of government, by having them participate in reviving those institutions, is the way we're actually going to bring the change by, about. By, by the people. Exactly. So the institutions of government that are critical must be returned to the service of the common good. And that only happens with um, top-down regulation. You know, the free market's meant to be a free-for-all, but it actually means that with lack of any rules or regulations, the big players can come in and dominate the rest. Well, the big players get really big. Banks, corporations merge with each other and become bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. You can go to any Western country and most other countries as well and see exactly the same massive corporations all around the world. You, the small person, are no match, zero match exactly. against any of that. But the government that you participate in is more than a match. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? So we have to restore the types of regulations yep. um, 
things like national banking, national ownership of vital services, infrastructure and so forth. Well, think about, just sorry, keep going, think about infrastructure. The, the, there are huge projects like the Snow Mountain Scheme, just, just a highway system, right? A proper railway system. The private sector um, cannot deliver that stuff because they're not interested in it. It takes the investments too long, et cetera. But where would our fun how would our societies function without those big infrastructure initiatives, right? Just there is an example of why government's essential. So it is essential. It's going to be there, right? You, these, these, these crazy neoliberals would like you to fantasise this John Galt, um, Ayn Rand <laughs> world where no government exists, right? Mm -hmm. Get that out of your head. It's going to be there. It's, it's therefore incumbent upon us to make sure it works. Mm. And you see that kind of monopolisation and cartelisation of <clears throat> crucial services really hitting a crunch point now. We had an article in our previous week's Australian Alert Service about this in example with the example of something like shipping, for instance. I mean, what if every nation had a national shipping line? You know, we could have actual control over pricing and so forth at a time of, you know, crisis and eco economic supply crunch like we're in right now. Um, but what we also want to talk about is how people intervene in the political process. And of course, it has to, there has to be a process whereby you can do that, uh, not just at each election, but in between times. And that's something that we've specialised in over the years in building a uh, educated political movement that begins to participate in the ongoing day-to-day -day process of politics. Uh, now, one thing, and we want to come into the details of our latest campaign on this, that is crucial for this is Senate committees because Senate committees were designed for public engagement to, to intersect the Senate as part of the, the Senate's role in reviewing legislation. Uh, and there's actually even been a Senate inquiry on this where Labor yeah. MP Kim Carr has talked about that essential role which has to be revived and in practice we're the ones that have done it in recent times. So we want to give an update on our latest campaign uh, and we'll go through some of the background of the neoliberal policies in a minute that led to the point where the victims of this sterling first rent for life scheme, which we've been talking a lot about in recent weeks, were ripped off. Um, uh, we're organising and we're very close to getting, hopefully it happens very shortly in the parliament, uh, a inquiry, a Senate inquiry to rip open, rip the facade off what has gone on here where ASIC is meant to be protecting these people and has not done so. Now, um, those Sterling First people affected by this scheme uh, were out again in force in the streets of Perth this week, Robbie. Yep, have a look at the, this video, Elisa. We, we, we were present. Um, this, is, this is great footage. But we'll, we'll just play the clip with the, uh, that, we've, that we've produced from this. But just pay attention to what you're seeing in front of your eyes, right? These are elderly people, some of them very elderly. Look how mobile they are. Uh, they are left to fend for themselves, right? They have been, they were, they were thrown to the wolves by ASIC. They've lost everything at the end of their lives. They, they can't start again and they've been left to fend for themselves. Now they are, they're, 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 they're going at, they're going for it, right? But just bear that in mind as you watch this, pay attention. Come 
Mr. Premier, come on, you can do it for us. Now you can click on the info button in the top right hand corner to get a fact sheet and a full report with all the background you need to pick up the phone and make a call uh, to your senators in your state and ask them, are you going to support an inquiry into Sterling first and, and more importantly into ASIC because this will open the door to a whole raft of scandals. Hopefully, um, Elisa, we see some action on this front next week. But just to, just to be clear, the, the, I actually regard them, their tenants are sterling first. That was a scheme that collapsed. They're victims of ASIC because ASIC is the regulator. It's the policeman and it deliberately didn't police this scheme. And we're going to go through why in a second. And please play, hang around to watch that. This is important. But um, uh, there's been lots of victims of ASIC. The Australian Financial Complaints Authority, which is this new body set up post the Royal Commission, reports it gets 70,000 complaints a year, right? And it was an ASIC chair um, seven years ago who said Australia is a paradise for white collar criminals. Mm. That's what our current system allows. This, this stuff goes unimpeded. Um, these elderly people have been uh, just a terrible example of the kind of victims that can be created though. And it, it's, it's not tolerable. So we, like the inquiry can open all that up, but really get to the bottom of what goes on in ASIC, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's been, we're going to talk about inquiries that happened before the Royal Commission, right? But this is, this is the Royal Commission did change everything. It just proved to people how corrupt the system was. An, an inquiry post the Royal Commission can show how shamelessly the government is trying to get away with doing nothing. Right? So that's what we can change by achieving an inquiry. And the calls people make mm. in that area can make a huge difference. And we've had a great response so far. I mean, obviously, there's over 140 people that are ASIC victims relating to Sterling First. We've brought in a whole bunch of other bank victims groups as well. And then we've got our support base of the Australian Citizens Party and intersecting other groups um, that we've mobilised on various... Well, one, one to speak of is uh, Choice... The Choice Organisation that, that puts out Choice Magazine, the Consumer Affairs Organisation, um, they're actually running a petition to get the government to expand its compensation scheme for victims because they come up, the Royal Commission said you need a compensation scheme for victims for last resort and uh, CSLR. So the government did it and it's just a terrible, pathetic token thing to make it look like they're doing it and it's going to do nothing. Um, and that's typical of this government. Mm. So Choice is running a, a large petition to to expand that, and that's one. That's that's a that's a a, a certain angle, and that's good. Um, but we need to we need to expose the corruption as well, mm. which is why the inquiry is also important, if not more so. Now, some senators' offices have reported they've been getting a lot of calls from WA, which is where most of the Sterling First victims are. Uh, other officers have said they've been overwhelmed with calls. Uh, we still have reports of people having the senator answer the phone themselves. And one of our supporters got on a 15-minute call with a senator, which was very useful, and uh, that person got a bit of an education. Um, and various other reports, such as one um, aide to a senator saying, oh, the senator's certainly not a fan of ASIC. So we've got the potential to get real traction here. So keep those calls up or get going on them if you haven't already. Uh, now, we want to get back into the, a little bit of the background of the economic policies and the theories that have led to this point. And there's an article this week in our Australian Alert Service newsletter. And again, um, we'll put the link up if you want to click on the info button. Um, it's called ASIC Overhaul Requires Paradigm Shift. And this develops some of the curvature over four or five decades uh, that dismantled all the kinds of regulations um, that would protect citizens, um, elderly people and, you know, everybody. Um, so we take this back to the 1981 Campbell inquiry and, and this is, then... And this is where, we, this is where we, we reveal the bogus economic theory we referred to in the headline. Yeah, that's right. Um, so the 1981 Campbell inquiry and then the 1997 Wallace inquiry... So these were major financial inquiries um, that were hallmarks for economic policy going forward for Australia coming, 
you know, through the last few decades. But those inquiries laid out the pathway to deregulate everything within our economy based on the quote unquote efficient markets theory. And that's basically the idea that markets as some kind of magical creature respond perfectly to all of new circumstances, all of new information and so forth. Um, so it's a self-adjusting process that you just let markets rule and everything else will be taken care of. Markets can't be wrong. Is a, that, that's the extreme shorthand way of saying it. That's what this theory says. Markets, because understand what deregulation is, Lisa. It's scrapping the rules. So, so think of it as a soccer game, right? The umpire says, I'm sitting down, rub out the lines on the pitch. The players can work it all out for themselves. Get rid of the umpire. Right, get rid of the umpire. You don't need the, you don't need the lines to mark the pitch even, you know, those are all rules, right? You, got, you players can work it out all for yourself. And that is essentially this fanatic, this fanatical neoliberal theory that took over the mm. global economy from the late 70s onwards. And it was the Wallace uh, inquiry that recommended the formation of ASIC and took that kind of regulatory authority out of the hands of the ACCC. Uh, and from there it went downhill. And from um, the time following the global financial crisis in 2008, uh, it really, the, the um, garbage began to rise to the top. And there was a series of inquiries that we go through in this article that ensued that began to reveal the uh, reality of ASIC's lack of regulation and the destruction of people's lives at the hands of such. Um, so there was in 2009 a Senate inquiry after the collapse of Storm Financial, which people probably remember. Uh, well, Storm Financial was, a, was a, um, a scheme in North Queensland, which was a margin lending investment scheme. And a lot of, lot of elderly people, again, were talked into borrowing against their homes to invest in the stock market, but, by, but invest money they've borrowed into the stock market. And that's called margin lending, because of course your return can look greater than it actually is. But when it goes bad, this was the story of the 1929 crash, that was, that was the, 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 you have a margin lending led crash and people, the banks have to foreclose because they've got to call in the stocks that have been bought with borrowed money and they're not worth as much anymore and the hot, there's thousands and thousands of victims in North Queensland. But at least the local branch of the Commonwealth Bank in South Townsville mm -hmm. um, was one, one Commonwealth Bank branch of the year for about four years in a row because all the Commonwealth Bank was interested in was just pumping out all this money to these, to these sucker investors um, in Townsville. And it was just it should never have been allowed to happen, and that's why it led to this inquiry. But ultimately, ASIC's defence, you know, because it wasn't ASIC's fault, of course, as yeah. they, you know, claimed, its defence was that its actions were consistent with the economic philosophy underlying the financial sector reform regime. That is such a revealing statement by ASIC right there. Hey, this is a philosophy we're following. Yeah. Yeah, the philosophy of this bogus idea that the markets can't be wrong. That is what mm -hmm. you've been following. And by the way, we're talking about Australia and we're talk this relates to these victims cases, etc. This also is the reason you had the global financial crisis. All the deregulation that led to that. The Wallace Inquiry is 97. In the United States, they repealed Glass-Steagall in 1999, mm -hmm. right? Open it up. Just let the speculators rip because they can't be wrong. The market, one, one individual can be wrong, but the market will instantly self-correct. It'll all be fine. And we had this explosion, derivative speculation, just pure gambling with money, other people's money, right? And it all comes crashing down. It's all going to be bailed out by taxpayers. Um, uh, my abiding image is the protest in New York where some African-American guy's holding up a sign, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Right, that's what you, that's what these banks had said to the people for decades. Suddenly, they're the ones being bailed out because mm. they'd all bought into this this idea, this bogus idea. The markets can't be wrong; they are efficient. Mm. But at this point, two thousand and nine, post the crash and that all being revealed, it was a really powerful moment for change. Yes, certain changes happened, but we didn't follow through on it, which is why we have to do it now. Um, so by the middle of that year, July two thousand and nine. Former Reserve Bank heads Bernie Fraser and Ian McFarlane had called for an inquiry, not just into some aspect like that storm inquiry was, but into the entire financial system. So these are people, you know, big 
bigwigs within the system that are saying we have to look at this. And they said the 1997 Wallace inquiry needed to be updated in the wake of the 2008 crash. An open letter was issued that same month in July 2009 by six leading economists calling for a people's bank and suggesting an Australia Post bank model to break the power of the big four and also suggested that Campbell and Wallace inquiries needed to be revised. You had Ian Harper at that time who was on the Wallace inquiry panel who also supported uh, a shift in uh, Australia, the Australian on the 3rd October 20, 2009, I should say, was this article uh, headlined, Apostle Loses Faith in Finance System, uh, talking about um, The architect, uh, I'll, read it, I'll read out the quote from, about Ian Harper because I love this. The architect of Australia's system of financial regulation has turned on his creation saying it failed to withstand the stresses of the global financial crisis and needs substantial renovation. Mm -hmm. That's Harper. Now, he's on the Reserve Bank Board. We've got to tell yeah. a story about him, Elisa. In, in 2008, he, September 2008, he, um, actually, you and I were in Cairns for a wedding. That weekend, on the Friday, he sent his wife, this, so this was October 11 and 12. He, what is that? That's uh, uh, yeah. 2008. That's 13 years ago this week, right? His, his, um, uh, he sent his wife to the ATM and said, get out as much money as you can because I don't know whether the banks will be open on Monday. That's what Professor Ian Harper said to his wife. This came out years later in books written about the, the GFC, right? And he was one of the architects of it. So he had a real shock. Mm. He, it was like, you know, this was palpable for him and he's one of the voices that called for uh, looking at it again. And then uh, similarly, um, 24th April 2018 in the Sydney Morning Herald, he said, we place too much faith in the efficient market hypothesis and in light touch regulation. And basically a period ensued of an intense fight between what we were suggesting in that um, we have to have national banks and top-down government regulation versus people like Joe Hockey who got up in Parliament and said governments should not be involved in banking. Well, he actually said about the GFC, this is, this is a few months after the GFC, he said that the conclusion to be drawn from the GFC in other words, he, the way he put it, he said, if there's one thing we've learned, Mr. Speaker, it is that governments should not be involved in banking, <laughs> even though it was an example of total unbridled, deregulated system and, and no, no, no government role at all. Now, as I said, unfortunately, there wasn't enough headway that was made on that. But, but, but by 2014, there were two more inquiries. There was a Senate inquiry into ASIC, which heard evidence from many bank victims showing that ASIC had ignored warning signs of misconduct and wrongdoing by companies that it should have been policing, leaving families ruined. I mean, this is the same thing again that yep. has happened in these recent years with the Sterling First people. Um, so this has been going on all along. Of course, in 2014, you also had the Financial System Inquiry led by David Murray. Now, of course, we made Glass-Steagall bank separation, where you prevent banks from engaging in speculative activities that burn people in the end. Um, we made it the issue and there were, in the first round of submissions they took, 280 submissions. In the second round, over 6,000 submissions, including one from Malcolm Fraser calling for Glass-Steagall Bank regulation. And we also dominated public hearings of that inquiry. In the interim report, David Murray actually stated that Australia should consider imposing a legal separation between the investment and retail part of banks which would prevent them from speculating. So it would be, in effect, in the direction of Glass-Steagall. The final report, however, did not recommend it, um, stating that neither APRA, nor the RBA, nor the banking industry saw a strong case for these reforms. And, and uh, look, and even though the interim report had said that, that was more reflecting the, the, the submissions, mm. that so many submissions had been made. And um, I actually, uh, Malcolm Fraser did make a submission. I wrote it for him. He, he, I, I said to him, we, you should, he agreed with Glass-Steagall. He was a big champion of it. I said, you should make a submission. And Malcolm Fraser was used to having staff. He said, you write it for me, I'll submit it. So, so I did. Mm. Um, and it was really, like it, was, it got a lot of attention. But 
it was never going to be recommended because not just not just did you have the existing regulators like APRA and the RBA that are totally captured by the banks, even David Murray, Elisa, the person, this this was the inquiry that everyone had been demanding. We need a financial system inquiry. So they, Joe Hockey did it, but by picking Murray, that was a deliberate choice to make it go nowhere. David Murray was the guy who had overseen the privatisation of the Commonwealth Bank, and he had he had spearheaded this disgusting change in Australian banking practice where suddenly the frontline staff at the bank branches were under enormous pressure to flog you every financial product under the sun, right? So that they could make more profits out of things you didn't even need. And it's that kind of, a lot of this stuff came out of the Royal Commission. He did that. He led that change in culture in Australia. Mm. Um, they wanted, you know, you'd go into the bank in those days to cash your wages check or something and you're being flogged an insurance policy or, or, a, or a, a home loan or whatever. I used to hate it, right? Couldn't wait to get onto internet banking <laughs> um, for that reason. But th this was this was bankers being encouraged to get involved in things they should have had nothing to do with, right? They're not there to sell insurance. They're not there to, to do those other things. They should have just been there to, to do basic banking. And so he was never going to recommend. He, he, he defined the universal banking system. He was never going to recommend Glass-Steagall. But um, it led to more, and more, you know, the problems never went away. And so then you had more inquiries like the Royal Commission. Yeah, so yeah, to round out this topic, the Royal Commission was kind of the pinnacle of these series of inquiries and what we're suggesting now is that um, we need a proper inquiry, um, starting by looking into ASIC and let, let it go from there because if it's a genuine inquiry, the threads that unravel are going to lead to this whole box and dice we've been talking about. And, and, and Lisa, just to be clear, I've made this comment quite a few times in the last month, month or two. Don't get cynical about the fact that, yes, we want another inquiry, right? The Royal Commission was a landmark inquiry. Before that, you'd had these discussions about the financial system. None of them acknowledged the corruption. None of them. The Royal Commission was different. It had to acknowledge the corruption. This system was riddled with criminality and corruption, right? Just remember how shocked everyone was at the never-ending revelations coming out of it that year, 2018. That's what makes an inquiry now more powerful than anything before that mm. because people have had that experience and now, an inquiry now will expose how this government, Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg and what they run, is just an intention to try and bury that Royal Commission and get on with letting the corruption run. They can't be denied anymore, just let it run free, mm -hmm. right? That's why it's a, it's a powerful thing to do. And this Senate, the makeup of this Senate, you've got, you've got well-meaning people in both the major parties, right? So the parties I can't stand, but there's well-meaning people within them and they play an important role. The crossbenchers tend to be mostly good when it comes to this issue, right? They want to help clean it up. The Greens have showed that. One Nation showed that. The other crossbenchers have showed that. An inquiry by this Senate at this time mm. with, this, with this motivation can be very powerful. Yeah, with the economic crisis bearing down the way that it is, we really have a moment of opportunity here. So make sure you make your calls to your yep. senators this week, or ASAP. Now, moving on to our next topic, the Labor Party scandal the Liberals are ignoring. Um, now, people have why. seen in the news over the last week or so um, with the uh, hearings that are going on with the Vic Victoria's Independent Broad-Based Anti-Corruption Commission uh, that uh, Labor Member of Parliament Anthony Byrne has confessed to 20 years of branch stacking, which means signing up fake members to boost his faction's power. Uh, but that's not <laughs> the aspect of the scandal we want to talk about. We've put out a media release today titled Media Berries China Scandal Revealed at Victoria's Branch Stacking Inquiry. So give us a bit of a sense of this, Robbie. Well, I, <laughs> I was... Uh... I just happened to be recording this hearing as it was playing on Sky News and I'd gone outside and someone someone texted me and said, did you just hear that? And what had happened was they the, the uh, this inquiry came about because last year, 60 Minutes did a story on this Victorian Labor politician named Adam Somurek, a state politician, and how, and how he was this ran a big branch stacking operation. And Anthony Byrne, a federal politician, Labor politician, is, was his factional ally. And some of that, but, but, the, but Anthony Byrne clearly had a role in the story that exposed Somurek because they used uh, audio tapes, taps, you know, wiretaps and video footage, secret video footage recorded from inside Anthony Byrne's office. 
So this led to Somirek resigning. People remember the scandal, but then, um, uh, or actually being kicked out of the Labor Party, the, the Federal Labor Party has taken over management of the Victorian Labor Party as a result. But Somirek clearly then had a falling out with his factional ally, Anthony Byrne. And in having that falling out, he has dumped a whole bucket of, um, you know, <laughs> garbage Expletive. expletives <laughs> on Anthony Byrne. It's led to these hearings and Byrne had to admit, yes, I've been involved in branch stacking. What I got to, what they actually read out though, so it, all, all the branch stacking's got lots of attention and Byrne has now resigned one of his parliamentary hearing uh, positions, which I'll talk about in a second, but the, 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 the actual, um, there was a text message read out from 2018, right, which is a text message from Byrne to Somirek in December 2018. And we want to play it, this part of the hearing, because you see the, the person talking is Somirek's lawyer, Remy, Van Remy, and he is reading this text message out to Byrne. So it's Byrne on the left of the screen, mm. and Byrne is listening to a text message he sent in 2018. So forget Byrne's, re I didn't record Byrne's reaction. Um, he just tried to downplay it as, you know, he couldn't remember it very well. But listen to what the text message said. Taylor for Conroy. Because if she mucks you up, I will make sure she guest stars on the next Four Corners Hatchet job on China, which I'll be on. Mr. Somieri, she appears to be okay. Okay, watch her, she's a rat fucker. Your uh, message in December of 2018 to Mr. Somirek. Now, what you, so what you have there, Elisa, apologies for the language, right? We, um, maybe, we've, maybe we've bleeded it out, but it, it's the same term that Kevin Rudd used to refer to the Chinese in 2009 at the Copenhagen Climate Change sub, Summit. It's a disgusting term. But this is a guy saying, hang on, they're talking about a, an enemy of theirs in the party, a factional, a, 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 a Labor Party activist that, they, that this guy, Anthony Byrne, hates. And he's saying that he can attack her by making her guest star in an ABC Four Corners hatchet job on China. The next one they're doing, which I'll be participating in. Mm. And then he, called, then he used that term. That is stunning. And I'll tell you why it's stunning. He is the deputy chairman of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, or at least he was. He resigned yesterday from that position. Um, uh, we, we've said, why, is the, why aren't the Liberal Party interested in this story? Because his best friends are in the Liberal Party. His best friends were people like Andrew, James Patterson and Andrew Hastie, who are also on that committee. And this, that, these people, Byrne, Hastie, Patterson, my old mate Kimberly Kitching, there's a, there's a small number of them who are, who, who are they're part of a gang in Parliament called the Wolverines. What are the Wolverines? They are the most anti-China people in the Parliament. This is a gang that set out to dis deliberately destroy Australia's relationship with China. That is what they did. They are loyal to the United States and the United Kingdom. Hasty and Burn Burn gets less attention, but I'm, that's why I'm giving him attention now. Hasty and Patterson, the Liberals on this committee, they're the chair. Hasty was the previous chair. Patterson's the current chair. People have heard, regular viewers have heard me rant about them before. They're not loyal to Australia. They're loyal to the United States and the United Kingdom, right? They're both, Hasty and Patterson are tied up with this outfit in, in um, London called the Henry Jackson Society. Henry Jackson Society is an organisation that exists to promote war. It believes that there should be permanent regime change wars. We, the, the countries like Australia and Britain and America should go around toppling every government in the world that is not a quote unquote liberal democracy. That's what they believe. It's a recipe for total global annihilation in the name of, which, which enriches the military industrial complex in the name of democracy. And just, just as an aside, Byrne, one of their allies, has been caught branch stacking. Yep. Democracy, Democracy is fake to these people. It's yep. garbage. Everything you, ha everything they ever say to you is lies, 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 lies. That's why we say this. Because if you don't want a war with China, pay attention to this stuff. Mm. The people that have been feeding you this garbage that it's that in the space of two or three years, we have gone from being a, a country that is happily China's best trading partner to a country that's trying to lead the fight for war. That is going to blow us up. And Chinese official, you know, a Chinese person will say, like to Stan Grant and the ABC, well, if there's a war, you're going to get the nuclear attack on Australia. 
And he's just saying it. He's not threatening. He's just pointing out the obvious. If you get the war you want, mm. that's, that Australia and the United States are at war with China, and it goes nuclear, the nuclear bombs are coming your way. Pay attention, people. So, you know, calm down again now. This, so, um, Byrne is in this committee. This committee has... Spe- it, it, it so this works is the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security? Yes. Andrew Hastie should be on this committee. Not Andrew Hastie, Andrew, Andrew Wilkie. Wilkie. He's an intelligence expert. He's a professional. And he's credible. He's the guy that was honest and courageous enough before the Iraq War to quit his intelligence job at the Office of National Assessments because he knew the claims about weapons and mass destruction were lies. Right? He's in Parliament. He's not, anywhere, he's not allowed anywhere near this committee. It's, it's, it's totally tied up between the Liberals and Labor. The two chairs are both Wolverines. Byrne is a Wolverine, mm. right? They, they, the Wolverines last year invited, um, uh, what's his name, the, the, the American ambassador to be one of their honorary members, yet they preach sovereignty. We're here to fight for Australian sovereignty. Um, and what they've done, the, the, oh, I have to say one more thing about Byrne. To give you an example of what a zealot Byrne is, Huawei is an issue that has become a bone of contention in the world between the United States and China and Australia and China as well, which Australia supposedly led the the attacks on Huawei. Um, And all Huawei is is China's most famous company, right? It's very good at what it does. Huawei is an intelligence. And we we claim, oh, it's it's here to spy on us, etc. But read Edward Snowden, right? We're the ones that do the spying on the world. Go ask Angela Merkel, (laughs) you know, I hope she enjoys her retirement. She won't have America East tapping on her phone anymore. Um, but we were making a big deal about Huawei. We got the, the daughter of the Huawei founder, our side in the world, got the daughter of the Huawei founder arrested and spent the last two years under house arrest in, in Canada. Um, but the one member of the Five Eyes, Australia, Britain, United States and New Zealand, that wasn't towing the line on Huawei was the UK. And in 2020, uh, February 2020, Dominic Raab, the UK foreign minister, came to Australia and Anthony Byrne had a shouting match with him demanding that the UK tow the line on Huawei as well, th- kick Huawei out of its system. And the UK to that point had been happy to say, well, we have GCHQ, which is the most sophisticated advanced spying operation in the world. We check all their technology, right? We're confident it's not spying on us. And that wasn't enough. And it was this guy, that, that, to show you what an anti-China fanatic this guy is, that's what he did. And, and, now, and now Britain has towed the line on Huawei. Um, so he reveals in this though, what we have go, go through in our press release, which is that there'd been a series of media reports on Four Corners, led by Nick McKenzie, the investigative reporter who's now with Channel 9. So he did all these reports. Most of them turned out to be false because plenty of times ABC and Nick McKenzie got sued for them and had to settle the lawsuits, and we, we document the ones in the show. And in this tweet, in this text message, Byrne, with all those connections, having been part of this operation to turn around, to turn public opinion against China, with this text, he is admitting that they were hatchet jobs. Mm. They're deliberately fraudulent, right? And that he will use his power to run a McCarthyite terror campaign against any one of his enemies because to be seen to be friendly to China and Australia now is completely politically damaging. Mm. That's what this, this is a, such a revealing moment. It's been completely glossed over by the media. They're not interested. The Liberal Party are not interested. Well, right? the Liberal, half the Liberals are defending him. Oh, they think he's wonderful. And so this is a guy, he's been forced to step down now from his deputy chairmanship of this intelligence committee, an intelligence committee which is supposed to oversee the intelligence agencies and yet those same intelligence agencies... Are the source of this disinformation, frankly. But they also declare... Uh, um, Byrne, they call him one of their own. That's yes. how close he is to the intelligence community. Yes, and Nick McKen, like you know, Nick. Mc- the, one of the th- points we we have a we link in the press release to our series of articles we put on our website from last year called the China Narrative we'll Series. We'll put that link in the box below. Yep. The um the the most important one is the the part five called All Roads Lead to ASIO, which shows that ASIO is part of the Five Eyes: Australia, Britain, United States, United Kingdom, New Zealand. Um, has run this operation to make sure Australia changes its policy towards China and becomes yep. very much uh, aligned with the United States and, and United Kingdom. And, and we have identified all these people are really close to ASIO, 
right? And uh, and that's why that's that's relevant. That ASIO says he's one of their own, yeah. and he, he, they're supposed to be the oversight over ASIO to make sure they don't operate as a secret police and just because they're unaccountable just make up a pack of lies. Well, he's basically admitting to colluding in the lies. Yeah, and Byrne lobbied for just about every police state power that's been rammed through in, you know, the last... Exactly. ..since 9-11. So if you want to um, kick the intelligence community and Five Eyes apparatus out of policy making, foreign policy, etc., uh, and restore real democracy, contact us, get the a copy of the alert for more information. Join us, go to our website, you can subscribe to the alert service, there's plenty you can do to get involved. Call your senators as well uh, immediately and um, that's all we've got time for this week at least. Thanks Robbie. Thanks Elisa. Thanks for tuning in, don't forget to like the show if you liked it, subscribe and tune in again next week.